Our chapel speaker today is a man we all love and appreciate. He is also someone who always insists on a short introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Pentecost. <laughs> And the chairman of our theology department walked across to where I was sitting, leaned way over to get down to my ear, and then said, don't blow it. <laughs> With such confidence, I turned to Mark chapter 3 and verse 14 where we read that Jesus ordained 12, first, that they should be with him, and second, that he might send them forth to preach. Jesus associated the 12 with him not because he felt inadequate for the work given him to do, because he needed their help, because he needed their encouragement. But he knew that he was addressing men who knew a lot about God, but did not know him personally and intimately. And I get that concept from one of these men who in the eve of our Lord's crucifixion, according to John 14, came to him and said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will satisfy us. Having had ex experience in handling questions for more than 60 years in a classroom, I can uh, understand how Jesus must have felt I'd be amazed if he didn't sigh a deep sigh and said, Thomas, what do you think I've been doing from the time of our first association together? I have been revealing the Father to you. If I were to ask you why did Jesus Christ come into the world, you probably would respond with Jesus' own words. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. You would be entirely right. When was that work accomplished? Not by his life, but by his death on the cross. What other ministry was entrusted to Christ? to which Christ is referring in John chapter 17 when he said in verse 6, I have finished the work that you gave me to do. This is not anticipatory as to what he's about to do within a few hours as he will be crucified. He's looking back over what he had been doing for the years of his association with these very 12 whom he had chosen to be with him. I have glorified thee on earth. And then in verse 6, he defines what it is to glorify God. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. I've introduced you. I've introduced you to, uh, you to them. And that's in fitting with John 1, 18, where John says that the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared or revealed or introduced him. God is a God who wanted to be known. 
And in revealing himself, he desired to receive worship, praise from those to whom he made himself known. And Jesus Christ was the first agent in God's self-revelation, and that was revelation through creation. And we refer to it as natural revelation. And Paul tells us in Romans 1 that nature revealed, first, the fact of the existence of God, and second, the power of God. But natural revelation was limited. And God's self-revelation of his love, his mercy, his grace, came through the second form of revelation, and that was the incarnation. So John tells us that grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Here a man from their exposure to the Old Testament knew a lot about God. But by his own testimony, Thomas is saying, while I know a lot about him, I don't know him. And Jesus Christ had come to make the Father known. To introduce God to man. This he did by the Incarnation. He came to introduce men to God, which he did by his death on the cross. And in John chapter 8, when the Pharisees challenged Jesus to prove that he is what he claimed to be, one with the Father, Jesus said, look at my words, listen to my words, and look at my works. Because my words and my works are not mine, they're the Father's. For the Father is using me as the channel through which he reveals himself. And when he responded to Thomas' inquiry, he used the same method. And he said that what he said did not originate with him. He was the channel through which the Father, by the words that he spoke through the Son, was revealing himself. And look at my works. Because it was the Father who was revealing himself through me as the channel of revelation. Men did not know of the love of God until they saw Jesus reach out to the needy, respond to their need. Saw him took babies in his arm and invite them to come to him. They did not know of the mercy of God and mercy's response to need till they saw Jesus reach out and touch a leper. Did not know the compassion of God till they saw Jesus stop a funeral procession and risk contamination under the law by touching that casket and restoring that dead one to life. All that Jesus said and all that Jesus did was designed to supplement what God revealed about himself in creation because creation says nothing about the love of God, about the mercy of God, about the compassion of God. That came through Jesus Christ. And I'm sharing a little bit of my own spiritual pilgrimage. I had the privilege of growing up from the time I was in first grade all the way until I left for college in a church that was committed to teaching the scriptures to young people. And our program was a program involving the memorization of scripture, not verse by verse, but chapter by chapter. We were saturated with it. Our pastor had attained a PhD 
from the old Princeton Seminary in his heyday, and he was an Old Testament major. Now, I'm not saying this to uh, his discredit. <laughs> but I can't remember in the years I sat under his ministry ever hearing a sermon that came from the Gospels or the Epistles. His preaching was always from the Old Testament. And when you're introduced to the prophetic books of the Old Testament, you will find that God through the prophet is denouncing sin, denouncing sinners, revealing his hatred of sin and his justice and his holiness in dealing with sin. And being exposed to that kind of teaching over a long period of time, I didn't stand in awe of God, I stood in fear of God because my own heart convicted me. I come to know Christ as a personal Savior, I don't know when, so early in my youth that I had grown up with it. I had been taught by my parents to spend time in prayer before I went to bed at night. It was a habit. Very easy to pray to Jesus. After all, he had a body. He wore clothes. He walked from place to place. He got tired and had to sleep. He got hungry and had to eat. He enjoyed fellowship with people. Felt very comfortable going to the sun. But my fear of God made me try to think my way across to the outer reaches of the universe to get near to God. He was distant, far away. After all, the catechism I had been taught said that God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, goodness, holiness, justice, and truth. He is a spirit, and the spirit doesn't have a body. How can I have fellowship with a spirit? Felt very comfortable with the sun. In college, we were required to take three years of Bible and survey courses, very good courses. We were offered a course in systematic theology as an elective the fourth year. And I had an excellent course a survey of Reformed theology. And I learned a lot about God. I wrestled with the big theological issues, Trinitarianism, Christology, uh, predestination and freedom of the will, and all those delightful subjects. Came to Dallas Seminary and was a theology major. And uh, sat under Dr. Lewis Berry Chafer for almost all of my theology. And then under Dr. John Walvoord, who was just in his second year of teaching when I came here. And then when I came and was a theology major for the doctoral program under the biblical th theological teaching of Charles Ryrie. But when I sat in an early class with Dr. Chafer, and he reminded us that biblically, God sets down the fact that we pray to the Father, by the Son, by the enablement of the Holy Spirit. And to me, that was shocking. Because when I tried to pray to the Father, I didn't feel comfortable. I didn't feel at home. I had learned something by the time I was finished my studies about God, but couldn't say I knew him personally and intimately. 1948, while I was teaching, Philadelphia College of Bible, one of the first courses that was assigned to me 
was the course in the life of Christ. That meant I had to get into the Gospels, saturate myself with them. And over a period of time, I found it to be true that what the Son had come to do, he was actually doing in me, in that by being exposed to what Jesus said and what Jesus did, I was coming to know the Father. And what a glorious realization it was. And I don't know when it took place, but I'd say over a period of time, I found that I could get on my knees and I could say, my Father. It was not enough to know theology. I had to come to know a person. And I find that Jesus, in anticipation of the fact that he would be going back to the Father and the world would still be in darkness and needed a revelation of his Father, he was spending his life in teaching these men about his father so that when he returned to the father they could continue doing what he had been doing and this is made so clear in John chapter 17 I've referred to it I have glorified thee on the earth and he explains what it is to glorify the father I've made your name known unto men there's a difference between glorifying the Father and worshiping the Father. You can't worship one of whom you're ignorant. But you can't reveal by your words and works one of whom you're ignorant. And if you're here to learn theology, forgive me, Dr. Bingham, you're here for the wrong purpose. If you're here to learn Greek and Hebrew as an end in themselves, you're here for the wrong purpose. You master these areas so that through them <coughs> the Spirit of God can introduce you to the person who's revealed to us in the pages of Scripture. And so a pertinent question would be, do you know any more about the Father today than you did yesterday? Now, it's interesting. When God would reveal himself, first he used inanimate creation that talked about the existence and the power the beauty of the Creator. When it came to reveal His love, His grace, and His mercy, it had to be revealed through a person. It had to be revealed through a person. And when I look in John 17, And I'm reading verse 18. And I'm giving you my own paraphrase or translation. For the same reason you sent me into the world, that is to reveal you by my words and works, even so I also am sending them into the world. See, the corporate body of believers has become the temple in which God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son dwell. And individually, John 14 says, we are indwelt by the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. 
Why does God occupy this body as a temple or the corporate body of believers? In order that through them, by their words and by their works, they can reveal who God is. So that those who receive that revelation might come to know the Father. Not theoretically in the head, but realistically, individually. Intimately to know the Father. We're overwhelmed at the tragedy around us. In the earlier days, we saw the devastation in uh, Biloxi, in New Orleans. And without doubt, many of you saw that and said, I wish I could be there to help. But you know you were prohibited from entering the city. Too devastating. And then we're appalled to read that life has become so dangerous in those cities. The law enforcement agencies are turning in their badges are going and hiding on rooftops for fear they'll be shot. And there's wholesale anarchy with looting and murder and rape. No one can go in there. But an amazing thing has happened. In the last several days, God has brought thousands of those who can get out of New Orleans and those cities to Dallas. And right now, Reunion Arena is filled to overflowing. And up and down Central Expressway, motels are packed with refugees. Do they need financial assistance? Yes, and our former presidents appealed to the nation to give. But you give those refugees money, and all they do is worship the almighty dollar. What they need is a demonstration of the love of God. And that's going to have to come. Not through a money gift to a fund, but through personal contact. What a difference it could make. Some of you would go to some of your classmates and say, let's get out of the security of the library and the classroom and the safety of our homes and our apartments, get in the car and go down to arena and just demonstrate care and concern for them. Just to be there would be to demonstrate that God loves them because I am concerned about you. To be there not to do something but just to listen. For I have found in 28 years of pastoral ministry the greatest contribution that one can have to another is not to tell him something, but just to listen. Weep with those who weep. And rejoice with those who escaped and escaped with their lives. Just to be there would be to share the love of Christ. And so you would be glorifying God. A little nearer to home. My first class, I asked the students to identify themselves, and one of the students said to me, I come from New Orleans. And I said, have you been in touch with your family back there? And he said, well, I've only been in touch with one member of my family. And when I inquired about the size of his family, I've forgotten the exact number, but it was something like 28. 
the second class yesterday afternoon, I asked him, have you heard from your family? He said, yes, I've heard from 14 of them. And he said, they're on their way to Dallas. And I said, are they headed to Reunion Arena? And he said, no, they're coming to my house. Gave no indication as the size of his house or the responsibility that he's taking on. And I can imagine wall-to-wall people who are delighted to have a dry, clean place to spread out on the floor to sleep. That's the love of God in action. But we could come alongside of that brother, stand with him, come to his assistance, support him emotionally, possibly physically or materially. God wants to love those who are in darkness, need to know his love through you, through me. And if it isn't done through us, members of his body, the tabernacle in which he dwells, it won't be done. That's why Jesus said, Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. See, God is using you to reveal himself or you are a teacher of theology. The department hasn't listed you yet, but God has. So what concept of God does your spouse have as she lives with you? What concept do your children have? What concept do your classmates have? What concept do those with whom you work have of your God? In our present generation, we're so so constricted by concepts of worship, we miss the fact that God has set apart his body to be the channel through which he reveals himself. And they do it the same way Jesus did, by what they say, by what they do. The unknown God didn't exist only in Athens. The same unknown God exists in Dallas. God has set you apart to continue the ministry that Jesus Christ began for for the same reason Jesus said he sent me into the world. I now in turn send you into the world. Let your light so shine they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. May the Spirit of God, our Father, be pleased to use this brief meditation on a small portion of your word to motivate us to demonstrate the love, the grace, the mercy of God to those in need. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.